which is how a half-orc druid from West Xanthia can even enter the council chambers of the Night Mother without immediate banishment to the Dark Wait, Dimension. did you write this? Yeah. I love it. Keep it exactly how it is. Make it a trilogy. Yeah, right? Yep. It's mm -hmm. not enough for one book. No, no it's, it's absolutely. Not absolutely. So. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sights and Sirens Back to Basics podcast, where we talk about basics, we talk about backs, we talk about the people that love them. Today's sponsor is American CME. American CME is an EMS continuing education company that offers free state mandated CMEs as well as CAPC credits for EMTs, specialists, and paramedics. You can check them out at AmericanCME.com to get started earning your credits with ease. Also, fun fact, American CME is now offering our podcast for credits. So you got good taste. Every other, yeah, exactly. Every other month, so like this podcast next month you can go to american cme's website if you listen to it there and take a short quiz you get you get some half credit and that sort of thing so awesome. i'm excited to be working with them a little bit on that so today i wanted to talk about today's topic this week's topic is um dnr so a do not resuscitate order um kind of interesting it's, it seems a little like maybe off topic for emergency medicine but it's definitely not and and the reason i want to talk about it is i kind of have a passion for it not not writing do not resuscitate orders. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> no, but so as an emergency, it's, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but as an emergency physician, my job obviously is to resuscitate people. Literally what I'm trained to do, right? People who are on the brink of death or about to die, my job is to try to bring them back to life, you know, so. But I have this huge passion for end of life care. I mean, you know this about me. So um, again, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but I think where this stemmed from was I, there's a lot of times, as you know, right, as a paramedic, there's a lot of times where I can't do anything, that, that, that people are beyond the point that I can actually resuscitate them, bring them back. And then mm -hmm. I spend part of my shift, if not an entire shift, being with them and their family as they, as they pass away. So as much as I'm trained to resuscitate, I also have developed quite a passion and heart for that end of light stuff. And, and as a part of that, obviously we run into a DNR order. Right. Um, so I want to talk about DNR orders today. I want to talk about what they aren't more than what they are. Sure. Uh, well, obviously we'll define them as well as advanced directives and things like that. Um, and just for people who are listening, when we say DNR, so I, I Googled, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, see if there's any data out there for do not resuscitate orders in emergency situations. And I typed in, you know, DNR emergency, and there was an article about some coyote on the loose and the Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> so not that, not that DNR, right? Yep, so yep. this is do, do not resuscitate. I mean, and sometimes you work for rural hospitals. I wasn't right. sure if like, you were just really into DNR. Exactly, stuff. exactly. Right <laughs> so, now. so again, I want to talk about a little bit about that today. So my understanding is that you have advanced directives, which are uh, end of life care or descriptions and how you want to be handled towards the end of your life or at, in emergency situations or at the end of your life or when um, unprecedented circumstances happen, right? So that's advanced orders. That's a very broad topic you can talk about. You know, I, I don't want to be intubated or I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want anything that would be considered rough happened to me you know people can be kind of vague with them mm -hmm. a lot of times and uh but a dnr is simply just a statement of if i am dead if i do not have a pulse i'm in cardiac arrest i do not want to be resuscitated and when we say resuscitation it's my assumption that we're talking about cpr exactly so and that's the thing so like a dnr is very very specific and i want to talk about both those you know what a dnr and advanced directive so a dnr though a DNR order or do not resuscitate order is just that basically what you described. So if my heart stops and I'm not breathing, don't do CPR. It's as simple as that. So there's like a couple different ways. So there's the simple, I mean, you can even like Google it and print one out, sign it. It's someone who is, who is, you know, they gotta be 18 years old and of sound mind in order to say, Hey, I don't want CPR done. Or obviously it has to be someone who is, uh, the, durable power of attorney for medical reasons who has signed it on behalf of someone who is not of sound mind, but who said, Hey, I want this person to make medical decisions for me. So a couple different, and at least in Michigan, there's a couple different ways that I think you would probably run into it. So either as like a bracelet, someone can have like a do not resuscitate bracelet, yep. uh, or they can, you know, produce, produce that the document. Yeah. Produce there's a lot document. of, a lot of discussion. I think a lot of times with like they have to produce that document and it has to be signed. Now, th this can technically a lot of times be in digital form as long as it's the official document, but they have to show us documentation. And I think sometimes medics are like, I don't trust that or you didn't really show me exactly what I wanted. 
And instead of being in the mindset of like, what's best for this patient? What's best for this patient's family? What did this patient truly desire? They just don't want to get in any type of trouble. So they're just like, well, we're just going to work them. And we want to try to shy away from that. You know what I mean? Our priority should always be, what did this patient want? What does this patient's family want? And then helping them provide that documentation, following the rules, but helping them provide what they need to provide in order to do what the patient wanted in the end. Sure. And that's and that's kind of the struggle, right? So it's a little bit different for me in the emergency department. So if someone comes in and, you know, let's say you roll in, you're doing CPR on a patient, and then their wife or significant other or, you know, child comes in, um, and not child, child, but, you know, I mean, like an adult yeah. child comes in and says, hey, listen, like, my mom would not want this, you know, she... I have the ability as, as the physician to say, yeah, you know what, this is probably, you know, futile care in the sense that even if we were to get her back, would she have any quality of life, that sort of thing. I've got to take a lot of things into consideration with that, her age, her comorbidities, her medical problems. But I can say, yeah, you know what, I agree, let's 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 stop and, you know, let nature take its, co- take its course, excuse me. But for you, it's different, right? I mean, like, and, and there's there's the liability piece. So what you're describing too is like you said, like a lot of medics. If you, if someone can't show you that document signed, you, technically by protocol, they they want you to continue resuscitative efforts, right? Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because uh, you have the ability to do that. I don't. I'm also working through someone like you though. So right, yeah. this is where communication I think is really key. Me, me communicating with you at the hospital, wh- whether it be by, by telephone or using the radio communication, but getting a doctor to that radio for potential priority four orders and things like that and say, hey, this is what we're dealing with. Hey, family feels this way. Hey, we've been working them for so long, right? Because in a way, you always make that decision. When we've worked someone for 45 minutes and we've met our protocol guidelines, I still have to call you for, for a pronouncement. You know, paramedics don't truly, you know, pronounce someone dead. They're not the end all be all decision. They, they, they work through you to pronounce someone. Sure. So, and when you say priority four, you're talking about a priority four call for people who might not know that term. Priority four call is basically. It's so priority one would be, you know, severely unstable, priority two, potentially unstable, priority three, we would refer to as walking wounded. A priority four patient would be like triaged black in an MCI scenario. A priority four patient is someone who's deceased. Who's already deceased. Yeah. So even in that situation, so even if you show up and someone's got a, you know, do not resuscitate order that's signed, they present it to you, you still have to call me for me to say, hey, yes, this person. Right. I have to call you either way, right? I can show up on scene and have the patient who's obviously been dead for weeks or who is decapitated and has there's no chance of us resuscitating, you're still the one that's doing the pronouncement, right? Mm-hmm. So it's always, I think medics get nerved out because they think that this, this hefty responsibility is on them. The responsibility of the medic is to paint a picture for you. You're making the final decision. And then I'm acting on you know, you're acting through me mm-hmm. and I'm mm-hmm. acting on your orders. And like, and the thing is too, is we, and like, as a not to nerve out the medics out there, but we do rely heavily on that, right? I mean, we rely on your report. A lot of times it's, you know, three in the morning, I'm passed out in the call room and the phone rings and I answer and I'm like, hello, like, hey, this guy's dead. And then, you know what I mean? Like, you, but you have to like paint a picture like he's been, you know, I, I see rigor mortis. He's been dead for a long time. You know, his brains are over there. And then right. I'm like, okay, yeah, cool time of death is uh whatever time it is right, right now right. you know and then i hang up it was like and not to like you know take the the heart out of that but you said like like you know you are an extension of the, of that emergency care and that sort of thing in that regard so again yeah so like kind of like taking it back to basics a dnr order is simply that statement signed statement saying that hey when i was of sound mind i decided that if my heart were to stop if i was not going to be breathing i would want you not to do cpr and sometimes we get a little bit confused because in, in emergency care, we use the term resuscitation a little bit differently. So resuscitation, I mean, like when we talk about resuscitation in this instance, in a DNR, do not resuscitate, we're talking about reviving someone who appears to be dead, right? It's, it's bringing someone back to life, right? Like right, it's yeah. tec- The technical definition of resuscitation is like necromancy right? <laughs> we're bringing people back from the dead they, they have already deceased right you know but we i think what we mix up a lot is stabilization and resuscitation because mm-hmm. our job is mm-hmm. always to you know stabilize and we feel that like i it feels like i'm resuscitating you if you're not breathing but you have a pulse i'm still resuscitating your breathing you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah so I, we get or like we, we talk about all mixed up we talk about fluid resuscitation we use sure. that terms right like, like someone who's dehydrated whose blood pressure is low we fluid resuscitate them well, 
we're using that term a little bit differently. So we're talking right. about stabilization versus resuscitation, which I want to talk on in a moment here. But going back to you were kind of saying with the DNR, people sometimes provide you with documentation that's not technically the official signed thing, but it's close. And and going back to, like I said, communicating with me and communicating with like what, what, what the patient actually wants, um, speak on that a little bit, right? Yeah, so like I, there's protocols and then there's, sometimes there's like the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And I don't sure. want to like think, I don't want people to think that we're encouraging you not to follow protocols or not to, you know, honor what those things are or not. But does that make sense? Yeah, and I think patient advocacy is is our chief priority out there, right? What, what the patient wants or wanted um, or what the family wants or wanted if they carry that kind of legal authority. So there have been times where I've, I've been on scenes of, you know, 94-year-old female patients who are, you know, on, on the couch and they're deceased and they died maybe within the last 15 minutes. So this is checking all the boxes per protocol of, okay, we get going, right? And you should, you absolutely, in order to cover yourself, should start resuscitative efforts, whether that be compressions with a bag, whether you're hooking them up to a Lucas device, whatever you're doing. But you should always start resuscitative efforts when we assess a patient and the patient's deceased. I've got family there who's saying, this isn't what she wanted. I don't have a DNR. This isn't what she wanted. This isn't what I want. You know, families around, they're crying, they're upset. They don't want to see the body go through that. You know, in those situations, instead of feeling all this pressure as a medic to make some sort of decision, I I can kind of put the onus on someone like you. I can sure. call and, and work with the medical provider, like the, the true provider, and say, what do you think? What do we want to decide together to do in this situation? And then act through your order. So there have been times where there's no DNR. There, and and the, the family admits that there's no DNR. Sure. But this is what they really think, and this is the situation that I'm seeing. And I've called medical control, and they've said, you know what, let's let's go ahead and pronounce. I don't want you to – because they can make that decision, right? right they're right. they're allowed to make that decision. I can't, but I can paint a picture. So mm -hmm. in those instances, you know, I think it's better to have that attitude towards things. Hey, let's work together to to do what's best in this situation for the, for the body, the patient, and the family, right? Instead of – I've heard kind of some horror stories about medics out there who maybe, you know, are like, no, like, it's all about the letter of the law. It's mm -hmm. all about the black and white. If they don't have a DNR, I'm working that body. I don't care if it's 104 years old and I've broken all the ribs and I'm I'm working that body for 40 minutes, right? right. And at that point, I think we're getting away from what the core of EMS is about, right? Sure. The core of EMS is about patient advocacy and, and helping people. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's, it, you know, it's, it's funny because in a lot of – I've had those instances – you know, not often, but I've had those instances where EMS, you know, brings a patient in and they're working them. And as soon as they hit the door and transfer them to my bed, I pronounce them. And it, it's not, yeah. it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a reflection on EMS. I mean, e EMS's role is different than my role as the doctor. But again, going back to what you said, I think there, there's definitely room for you to be able to make that phone call. Now you can't not do CPR and Correct. call me and Absolutely. say, right. So, and I've actually had this happen one time where I got, and it, it actually wasn't EMS. It was a very rural community where they didn't have, you know, the, it was out of state and they didn't have the type of EMS agencies that maybe you know, we're used to. And so it was a volunteer type of thing. So they, they called and said, um, you know, this patient doesn't have a pulse and they've got, uh, you know, they're not breathing. Um, you know, can we give a time of death? And I said, well, how long have they been down for? And they weren't really sure. And there was no DNR. And I said, well, you should probably bring him in. And they said, well, we're not doing CPR. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, we'll start. time of death <laughs> Time of death was whenever you didn't like stop. Apparently they'd like started CPR and then stopped and called me. Okay. And it was like, well, whenever you stopped CPR was yeah. technically when they died. I mean, so again, like I said, I think you, like you said, you have to start those things. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, and then like, and then call in and, and, do, and do that type of stuff. It's very different, obviously, than like a 36-year-old male who collapses and his buddy's like, ah, don't worry about it. He wouldn't want this. You're like, well, that, you know, like, obviously you take all of this right. into consideration. There's common sense there. But again, it's not my job to, you know, to do anything but paint a picture. Like, it's mm -hmm. your job to, to make those calculations and figure that out, what you think is most viable. You know, I think sometimes we step outside our role in, in EMS and we we think bigger of ourselves which there's nothing wrong with it in most cases, but, you know, we don't want to get too big for our britches here and think like, hey, I'm I'm deciding whether or not this patient's going to live or whether, you know what I mean? If, if, right. if you think that there's a chance that you can bring them back 
I, I mean, then you're gonna you're gonna do the best you can to do that, yeah, right? Yeah. So it this actually, is only in extenuating circumstances where we have things like, hey, the whole family's there. It's a very very elderly patient, you know. Right, right. And I, you know, we follow our protocol to identify obvious signs of death, right? We're not talking about situations where there's dependent lividity or fixed pupils and they're cold to the touch and there's rigor mortis, things like that, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. We're not talking about that. That's a simple pronouncement because the the body has has been gone for a while. We're talking about, ah, it's kind of on the line, right? Ah, it's kind of like, and, hey, it's only been a couple minutes. And what is the patient? What did the patient want? Yeah, and yeah. the patient was begging for me not to do it. You know what I mean? And that's something worth saying too. Sometimes that we we work with patients who say, hey, I have a DNR and it's signed. I changed my mind. Yeah. And then they go in the back of your ambulance. It is absolutely your responsibility to work that patient. Right, right. Right. You can you can decide to change that at any time. You can't be like, well, you filed the paperwork, you know, in August of 2009. <laughs> Too so bad. You're done. <laughs> right. You know, we don't get to do that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. always err on the side of the patient. What's best for the patient um, and the patient's body. And I, I don't think you're going to go wrong with yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, taking that, you know, back to basics as we do. So a do not resuscitate order is referencing a patient who has no pulse and who's not breathing and who has signed paperwork or a bracelet or whatever, a clear indication that they wouldn't want CPR done. Now, we're going to do what's best for the patient. So if we have family and we have a patient that this is probably not going to end well, or we might not have a lot of luck in resuscitation, even if we did try and family's telling us not, well, then there's room for us to, as you know, as EMS providers, there's room for you to call medical control, talk to me, let's make that decision together since I have a little more uh, ability to to help actually, you know, say that and that sort of thing. So that's different though than advanced direct. Also though, I want you were talking about how like sometimes in EMS we can we can, you know, get, get too big for get too big for bridges. I heard this joke the other day and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but I said what is the uh, it says what's the difference between God and a paramedic? And that God doesn't think he's a paramedic. <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. But no, anyway, so anyway. So this is different though than advanced directives. Okay, so advanced directives can be very general, they can be very specific, but this is where someone has sat down and really thought out like, what do, if, you know, if I'm critically ill, this is not death, right? This is if I'm critically ill, if I have to be hospitalized, you know, we can also talk a little bit about hospice and that, that here as well. So advanced directives are a little bit different. They can be very general or they can be very specific, very specific, in fact. I mean, that you can, you can get into the real nitty gritty. These things have to usually be filled out with a medical professional, sure. right? I mean, this has like, you, you have to really understand what happens in the hospital or, you know, when you're need to be stabilized and these types of things. So do you, do you want to speak on that a little bit too? Like the difference, yeah, like the advanced, so what the advanced directives are? I think the big mix up is there, there have been times where we've been called out to hospice patients and afterwards I've heard, you know, people say, why did they even call EMS? Why do they even call EMS if they're on hospice? Because, you know, hospice means that it's end of life care. And therefore, like, why would they even call EMS? Well, because they were having an emergency, right? Like it doesn't stop care that that's easily treatable or even symptom care, like palliative care, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, none of that stuff stops. So, you know, hospice is just that they have a condition that they decided to no longer you know, treat the underlying condition. Maybe they have, you know, progressive stage four cancer and they don't want to treat that. They're not actively trying to fight that cancer anymore. So they're they're letting that cancer, you know, take course through their body. But it doesn't mean that they they're okay with experiencing pain or they're okay with experiencing shortness of breath or any of the things that can come with that, right? So it's still our job to treat those things, which means that hospice patients will go to the ER all the time. Absolutely. Let the ER have discussions with with when they should call and when they shouldn't. My job is is to provide care, right? And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this topic today. So I've seen this happen, not often, but it happens enough where, and I think I Going back to the, how we define resuscitation in emergency care and how we define some of these things, I think sometimes we have this, we, we confuse DNRs with advanced directives. So again, advanced directives are, you've taken the time to think about, hey, would I want to be intubated? Would I want to have, you know, a central line placed in the, you know, would I want someone to put a tube in my chest? I mean, like all these like different things that can be very invasive. Would I want those things done based on my age, based on what I know about my body, these types of things. Those are advanced directives. And they usually will include like a DNR order or a, or not. Um, but they're also not an all or nothing thing. So I think we, we, we fall into two 
uh, tricks or I think traps in, in emergency care when it comes to these types of things. We either think it's all or nothing. Like you either chose to get care or you chose to not die get, in the woods. Yeah, there's no, right, like, there's, there's no in between, right. which is just not true. Just not true at all. You know, I've even had patients who have, have a DNR. This happened like once or twice where they said, I don't want you to breathe. I don't want you to intubate me, but I do want you to do chest compressions. Right. I'll do that. That's fine. Yeah. Do, will that work? Maybe not. But if that's what you wanted, I mean, like my job is not to, like my job is to honor you as a being and as a human and as a, as a, as a right. patient. If that's what you want, that's perfectly fine. I, I'll do that. I probably won't get you back, but that's okay. That's and those discussions want. are had, right? That That's the time when patient education happens and right. things like that. And that's done with the provider. Yeah, exactly. You know? Or I have patients who say, hey, listen, like I, you know, want to go into the hospital. I want all these things done, but I don't want... You know, like one specific thing. Like I don't want to be intubated. Does that mean that I'm not going to put them on BiPAP and try all these things? No, I, I definitely will, right? Like there's nothing wrong. Just because it may not make sense to us clinically as clinicians doesn't mean that, I mean, that's fine, right? So again, I think we fall into two trusts. One is this all or nothing thing. Like you either like, and hospice is a little bit different, right? So hospice is you have an illness that probably will take your life within the next six months, like, like a stage four cancer or something like that. So hospice is basically we are going to work on giving you quality of life for those six months. Um, and obviously in terms of like someone on hospice could get a pneumonia. That's very treatable. Right. So again, so we fall into this trap of like it's all or nothing. Like well, you've decided to have care or you decided to not have care. Or we fall into this trap of defining resuscitation incorrectly. So someone who says like I'm DNR or it kind of they're kind of like I'm kind of saying the both both the same thing here, but if I'm do not resuscitate or if I'm on hospice or if I have advanced directive saying I don't want these things, we think like, oh, cool. Well, then we don't have to like really worry about anything. And that's right. just not true, right. right? I mean. Well, and I don't know, you know, when it comes to hospice, I mean, you can still want CPR done and, and mm-hmm. be in hospice. And that's why I think sometimes people are like, oh, they're on hospice. Why would I bother? It's like, well, just because they're expecting to die in the next six months doesn't mean that they don't want you to try to bring them back. It's just that they're not treating that active condition, right? Like, right. yes, they, they died of heart failure or they died of stage, let's say they have stage four cancer. They're dying from that stage four, four cancer. And because of that, they stop breathing. That's not what they don't want to be treated for. They want, they want to try to be resuscitated. They want to try to live as long as they can. They just aren't taking chemotherapy or radiation, things like that. They're not treating that active condition. They still want to be resuscitated. So I, we got to be really careful that we don't write off like, oh, they're on hospice and this isn't what they, you know what I mean? We, we really right. need to make sure we're being patient advocates and erring on the side of caution until then. Until then, until we're sure, we're going to we're gonna be working that patient and doing everything in my ability you know, everything that I have to do for that patient, I'm going to do until I'm told otherwise with official documentation, a medical bracelet, or medical control orders, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Maybe I'm the one who initiates the medical control orders by painting a picture to you, right? But I will do everything I can until I have one of those three things, right? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And then the other thing, too, is that we're, we're defining a couple of different things. So we, talk, we talked about DNR. We talked about these advanced directives. We talked about hospice. There's another thing that, like, people on hospice or even people who are not on hospice, can we can do what's called comfort care. So comfort care is basically this term we use to say, you know what, we are going to only do things – or mostly do things to bring this patient comfort as they pass. And that could be over the next 24 hours. That could be over the next week. So that's going to be, you know, pain. Like you said, just because you're, you know, advanced directives say you don't want to have all these invasive things done doesn't mean you want to be in pain, right? So right. we'll treat people's pain. Um, you know, even things like I said, like an infection, like it, if it's treatable, I want to put that patient on antibiotics, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's, like there's, there's nothing wrong with prolonging life, you know what I mean? Just because someone's saying, I would like to die naturally. I mean, there's, there's aspects there. And those conversations can be had between family, between patients, things like that. Well, and this can be tough. You know, it's tough. I've been on scenes where I knew that I was going to come back that night to pronounce the patient and the patient's talking to me. Like, like they're, yeah. they're going, they're kind of, they're starting to fade from consciousness. They're in and out and they're discussing with me, like how they want the day to go. And that can be very challenging as, as someone we're trained kind of in an adrenaline filled way to do everything you can all the time, as fast as you can, as effective as you can. And it's on, 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 go, go, go to be switched to a role where 
your job is literally to hold back, you know, that, that can be really tough. I do want to clarify, though, that discussions were had with medical control throughout this whole situation, right? Mm -hmm. The family or even the patient can't just be like, hey, just so you know, I'm about to go. Like, I'm about to pass out here. I don't want you to start an IV on me. Like, I have to. It's implied consent as someone's as soon as someone's unconscious, right? right? So unless they have that documentation or have been ordered by a doctor, I have to do the skills that I've been trained in, right? So it it is it can be kind of nuanced, but I think the theme of, of the day here is talk with your doctor. Talk with the doctor on the mm -hmm. phone and, and make a plan with them and say, okay, how do you want me to handle this th these things as they come up, right? Yeah. And that's hopefully – what they've already done, and they can provide documentation showing that. Then you call medical control and you confirm that with a doctor. Hey, I've got this paperwork. It says this. That's why we're withholding, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I think I think you kind of summed it up here, and, and, and we'll do that now. Basically, you know, this idea that a do not resuscitate order is a very straightforward thing. Right. Our goal as emergency providers is obviously to advocate for our patients, to give them what they would have wanted, what they do want, and that sort of thing. So there is, you know, it's very straightforward. A do not resuscitate order equals this. But opening that communication between your patient, between your medical control from an EMS standpoint. And then also, like I said, realizing that it's it's not an all or nothing thing. Like we don't have, just because it might not work, doesn't mean that we aren't going to treat people in a certain way. So that, that's kind of the message I wanted to give out today because I've seen this happen where a do not resuscitate is not a do not treat order. Right. Right. You know, right. and hospice doesn't preclude someone from coming to the emergency department and getting care. And I'm going to try to send them home if I can, but if they're going to be more comfortable in the hospital, maybe I'll keep them there. They're, it's not as cut and dry and it shouldn't be cut and dry. Right. Everyone's right. different. Everyone's desires are different. Everyone's bodies are different. You know, obviously our role is to be advocates and that sort of thing. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. But I wanted to finish with this because people see you, you've seen these, you know, um, reports and, and like in the news and stuff. So what would you do if you showed up and someone had DNR tattooed on their chest? <laughs> I would work them. You would per work protocol, them. I, would, <laughs> okay. I would work okay. them. A Just DNR you. tattoo, at least in my protocol, is not an adequate okay. way to identify. Good I've time. heard stories of like doctors having on their chest, like don't do compressions. It's like, you should know better. You're right. a doctor. You, you're the one who sets this stuff <laughs> up Just for sign people, the paper. Right? I don't know. Like, okay. All right. So for any listeners who are thinking about getting a DNR tattoo... It might not work for you. Maybe just get right. the bracelet or sign the form. Yep. So, all right. Well, we appreciate you guys listening. Uh, we hope you guys have a good week. Come back next week. Check out our website. Check out Facebook, Instagram. We're on there all the time as well. Uh, if you've got topics you want us to discuss, shoot them our way. But uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time. Again, continuing education credits are now offered. So next month, check back on American CME's website. They're our sponsor today. Uh, if you need continuing education credits, check out their stuff. Uh, we appreciate it. And you guys have a good week. Stay sweet. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're an EMT or medic student, or an advanced EMT student, or an instructor of those students, we have a program just for you. With Sights and Sirens NREMT prep program, you get video lectures over 15 hours of really vetted, great content to help you through your program and help you prepare for the test. Check it out at www.sightsandsirens.com.